Yeah. Here we are. I'm now recording and I'm going through the policy. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to, con to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with the Linux Foundation activities are described in Linux Foundation antitrust policy. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company council, or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrea up the Grove of the firm of Gasman up the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. So welcome everybody. We just came back after a while, you know, after our last meeting on 22nd of December. It's nice to see you all here. I'll leave it on to uh, a tool to start the meeting. It's going to be interesting for everybody who joined us today. A tool. Yeah. Well, no, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Andrea, and uh, welcome everyone to. Uh... Uh, trade finance special interest group for 2021 and uh, I think you know we are in for an exciting year and it's my pleasure uh, to be the vice chair and also to kick the session off for the year along with uh, our community leader Rose uh, so yes yeah, so Rose uh, maybe just a bit of an introduction from you as well and then I'll just share my slides Yeah, thanks, Atul. Um, yeah, just pleased to be here and look forward to doing this joint presentation with DLT Ledgers uh, and how we're working together with Bolero. I, I look after Bolero's uh, business development for Northeast Asia and uh, and for Australia, New Zealand, Oceania region. So uh, a fairly broad remit, but uh, yeah, just think we should get into it and start talking about um, today's subject, Atul. Absolutely. All right, so I think, uh, you know, Andrea reached out to me to talk about, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, working together between DFT Ledgers and Bolero Meads. I, I think some, most of you would have seen the press release that went out uh, last year, and I wanted to take an opportunity to do a little bit bigger and, and maybe give an opportunity to also ask a question to uh, myself, uh, you know, I look after the business development uh, as well as the market uh, development for DLT Ledger. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, co-present this along with Ross. A uh, number of other colleagues and and uh, uh, and the team members of DLT Ledger are also on the call. So we would love to keep it interactive. We would love to keep it uh, more informative. And what we would do in the session is really just walk you through a little bit about uh, what you know, uh, each of us are doing and what this partnership means and uh, more kind of giving also a closure to the uh, closer to the pin a touch I think from an Asia Pacific angle where both of us are based and you know working on so uh, you know uh, we have colleagues on the call from from uh, from other parts of the world as well so you know do chip in as well as we kind of build this uh, joint strategy together so with that uh, I'll just kick off uh, what you know, if if you already not know about DLC ledgers, uh, you know we are now uh, uh, into the fourth year of the running. Uh, uh, Singapore headquarter, uh, you know, uh, a deal, uh, cross border trade digitization platform. We we got uh, uh, 2020 was a, a really pivotal year for us, where we really crossed the chasm and you know we kind of moved into uh, uh, a real prominence where you know we have been. Uh, uh, helping customers uh, of various t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, as well as, uh, you know, participating, uh, you know, business partner and ecosystem of those customers uh, along with the, at the bank. And I think, you know, based on the internal modeling that we did, 
the tipping point of the network was reached somewhere around June or July of last year. And after that, I think we see uh, momentum really pushing us forward like they do in, in you know, any, any form of the business. So we are running a great momentum right now, uh, you know, in terms of what we do with our customers. I think we all have over now 529 customers. Uh, so I think this is still, uh, you know, uh, growing every day, uh, uh, over 21 large corporates, uh, over 45 over banks in the network. And uh, the, you know, the number uh, of uh, trades as well as, you know, the dollar value that is financed is well over 3 billion. Um, in terms of the support and the ecosystem that we are looking at building is, which is where, you know, we are building more and more partnership as we feel that collaborative partnership working together with, with a like-minded player, uh, I think makes a lot of sense where the network needs to connect to each other, network needs to have a touch and feel uh, with, with each other, not just talking about interoperability at a technical level, but there has to be also at the process and the people level in terms of how you know, we all can actually coexist and make it easier for customers towards their digitization journey. Uh, now we have over 70 staff um, uh, across uh, different parts of the world, including I see people from Middle East dialing in. So we have a, our Middle East and uh, Menai headquarter, Middle East and Africa headquarter out in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we also have offices in, in India. Uh, as well as uh, partner offices in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and as well as in Africa. In terms of uh, what we are also beginning to see is also a convergence of how enterprise systems, uh, you know, such as, uh, you know, your own classic, uh, you, know, uh, you know, operating systems of uh, the enterprises such as ERP, merging in terms of the technology uh, into uh, you know uh, mixing machine machine learning as well as what you what we could see on the blockchain together. So I think it's it's also the combination of next generation, not just focused around you know uh, a standalone piece of technology, but also how it can you know uh, mix along with the operating system of the organization is where we spend a lot of time. Across the sectors, we we you know we are proud about our team. Our customer success and customer adoption team has done a fantastic job of creating uh, trigger table, uh, a smart contract, pro smart contract templates for over 75 different commodities. And that is really helping us uh, in a, across uh, to really get any new uh, um, uh, you know, company to get started. And we also see more and more uh, uh, merchandising trade type of opportunities coming through as well. And you know, manufacturing companies uh, coming out of exporting, uh, you know, uh, their manufacturing that uh, from let's say from Singapore into other parts of the world, we also see them kind of coming into the uh, into the fold of DLT ledgers and continue to build uh, more and more on this. We have got decent recognition from you know external parties as well as also from Singapore government, and you know we are into uh, a thick of running the digitization program for any companies. Who are looking to get uh, get digitization started? Uh, you know whether it's about looking at contracts, whether it's looking at getting account parties on board, whether it's looking at you know integrating with their own um, you know uh, current systems, whether you're looking at hey, can I actually have a, a, a baby steps before I get started? It's all about providing a journey and a curated fashion is what we we stand for. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it to uh, Ross to just talk a little bit about how Polaro is leading uh, the digital trade revolution as well. Thanks, Atul. Yeah, um, Bolero has now been as a business for around 20 years. And I think of that, I've been involved with Bolero for 17 years. And if you look at the phases, I'd say at least for the first, first half of that, Bolero was was really out there a lot on its own trying to digitize uh, trade. Um, and then in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen evolution of other parties getting involved. And, and of course, with blockchain technology over the last five years. So a bit of history of how Bolero came about, it originated from an EU initiative. It was a research study to um, dematerialize or what you call digitize uh, international trade. Uh, process flows, um, and it was put together by SWIFT, uh, the banking community and the TT club, the insurance, uh, marine insurance uh, community. So 
Bolero, from its foundation, uh, really relied on a lot of expertise, uh, his, the people that have worked in trade uh, and moved across into the digital space. Um, groundbreaking market leader and innovator, true. Um, like I said, uh, it was pretty much a green field in the early days, um, but that comes with a lot of challenges. Um, you know, honestly, when you're doing it all by yourself, it's, it's really hard to uh, make change at a rapid pace. So there was progress, but the, the thing we've, we've achieved over the years through Bolero's initiatives has been a lot of, um, you know, firsts of, of different um, aspects, first electronic bills of ladings, first electronic presentations, first multi-bank solutions, et cetera, et cetera. But the real opportunity is to scale it up. And, and like what Atul mentioned, you know, reach a tipping point. And, and that's what Bolero has been able to do uh, in terms of the community that's attached to Bolero. Um, so the good part about it is a lot of experience with Bolero, um, but also a lot of recognition that you can't do everything by yourself. And, and that's probably the underlying opportunity with Bolero and DLT Ledgers is to have opportunity to bring together expertise that's very complementary and it makes the overall solution um, much, much better received by the, the customers, the clients, and much more in demand by those wishing to engage in trade digitization. Absolutely, so maybe... and then if you look at uh, you know uh, you know your foray into the blockchain, and I think you have been advocate about the same, right, Tyro? So you want to maybe give a little bit of your flavor here as well. Yeah, well, we've seen a bit of a trend where there's an opportunity to leverage, if you call more established technologies such as a Bolero. Um, for the provisioning of, of uh, I guess, um, certain aspects of the trade flows that have been accepted, uh, but to complement the new initiatives that have come through developments on blockchain platforms, um, DLT. And, uh, you know, we had a, a long, hard look as, as blockchains evolved and where, where can Bolero fit in um, with its current technology stack and, and in a way we we found that well Bolero kind of is a bit like a private permission blockchain um, and therefore we looked at how we could synergize what Bolero does into a, a, a blockchain platform that might need for instance you know today's topic an electronic bill of lading and, and we've done that with a number of um, uh, well-known you know blockchain initiatives and we're, we're seeing a lot more of these evolve uh, as we speak. Um, so, you know, that's that's the tenor of what we're going to talk about today, how, how you know, what, what DLT Ledgers is providing and then how Bolero fits into that ecosystem and, and what we bring together uh, to make the whole solution uh, more viable for clients and able to scale faster. No, it's awesome. It's, it's a great vision to have that, uh, to really you know, uh, connect in an open way to the network and, you know, participate with the new technologies. So really kudos to you and your team uh, there. Aro. So I think, uh, you know, you know, in terms of where you see, uh, you know, we working together, maybe just a bit of a color uh, would be helpful here as well, Ross. Sure. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to, um, uh, override anything about DLT ledgers you don't know at all. But basically, if, if you look at the offering, you know you're doing pre-shipment finance with bank funding um, yep. between um, buyer and seller, yep. and um, after there's been a payment made through the DLT ledger platform, um, what we're doing is adding the ability for a EBL, Bolero EBL, to be passed from the carrier via DLT ledgers through Bolero out to the uh, commercial uh, parties. So the supplier is the first recipient. They will then forward a copy to their uh, bank and the supplier then is able to use the Bolero processes to transfer the uh, electronic bill of lading via DLT ledgers all seamlessly through to the buyer. And then the buyer's got options. What do they want to surrender the EBL through the platform? and pass it back to the carrier so that they can get the goods or do they need to switch it to paper because it might uh, be the next party in the chain is not on the electronic platform. So that's the general part of it. DLT is providing its service and Bolero is 
putting in the extra yards to provide the EBL, um, which, as Atul mentioned to me the other day, you know, one, there's an existing opportunity, but there's also clients that are asking for this sort of addition uh, to the solution. Yeah, exactly right. And, and I think it's, it's, it's really kind of, uh, you know, connecting the dots, if you will, for you really to provide an end-to-end -end trade digitization, which is where, you know, we, we, we believe that partnership is really two plus two equal to five. And, you know, uh, just to also, you know, put direct uh, view into what, what, is, what we think, how the integration is complementary, right? So I think, you know, what we are really good at is really looking at the entire the life cycle of the trade, uh, you know, all the way from the deal confirmation to looking at, you know, managing the different types of contracts, uh, helping them to convert them into smart contracts, looking at making sure that all the laundry list of over 27 different types of documents that may be needed for the trades in order, making sure that all of them are authenticated and, you know, um, uh, uh, blockchain, if you will, uh, for the purpose of authenticity and really, uh, you know, also involving the banks for, for, the, for, the, for the finance, as Rose mentioned in the previous uh, conversation, uh, really making sure that they are uh, in there to support uh, and also providing a really a collaborative platform where different parties uh, who could come and collaborate as if it relates to that particular trade. And, uh, uh, you know, a huge amount of effort has gone in um, to really, you know, provide the maturity to the platform that we, you know, we have it now running over two years uh, uh, to provide uh, consensus to uh, different types of, uh, you know, terms and conditions uh, that one would have in the trade as well as you know, what different types of trade point and instruments you would be looking at. Uh, and you know, as, as, as the modal nature of the platform, you know, we do allow uh, uh, open account, uh, supply chain finance related support from a bank account, bank uh, FI point of view, so, as well as the documented trade support. Uh, and you know, providing really a, a granular uh, tracking of the trade flow, I think, at, at each step in the way, I think has is, is been a winning for our customers. And uh, quite a few of our customers as we have been working closely over the last uh, you know, couple of years have been demanding you know, a, a good uh, rounding off uh, for an end-to-end -end, uh, electronic BL. Uh, and that's where we thought it would be absolutely vital for our customers as well as the joint customers that Bolero has uh, with us. Uh, it would be great to uh, you know, build this integration which really provides uh, the complementary uh, capabilities. And what, you know, in terms of the nature of the DLT platform, that's one of the reasons why I applaud the Bolero and the team, because I think uh, the technology has come to the level where, you know, we are at, uh, because of the architecture that we put in place, we are almost able to plug and play any different modules. And we have 16 different uh, uh, deep modules uh, that is part of the platform today. And you know, ranging from supply chain finance to KYC to dynamic consensus to the smart contracts uh, to uh, you know, documented trade, uh, the works right. But to really look at what is needed as part of the trade plan, connecting that in a plug and play fashion is really in an open environment. Really, is where you know we thrive ourselves. So I think you know, Bolero, uh, we believe, and then Rose, you can add in one side kind of. Uh, put in my flavor to it, we believe you're bringing a huge level of support in terms of electronic bill of lading processing and, and management of it. Not just the rule book, but there is also an entire framework that you know you have tested over a period of time and you know you continue to do quite massive work in that space. Uh, and you know as an original uh, eBell e provider, uh, you know obviously suffice to say that you are already you know, uh, you know, setting the strand, if you will, in terms of the PNI club approvals, and also in terms of the number of carriers and the trade flow and the port pair, that what could enable. I think you got a significant coverage with over 22 carriers and you know supporting. You know, I was talking to one carrier who, uh, and you are, you are in terms of uh, you know uh, your e-business, their e-business solution is already integrated with Colorado, which really makes it easier for carriers to also participate in this trade flow. So I think you know the continuous uh, uh, adoption of the carriers and 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 improve on, improvement in that area I think lend itself well to have more and more trade flow opened up. Uh, I do believe that you know if uh, if we can do more and more port pairs and more on the trade flows between different parts of Asia, Africa, 
uh, Europe and, and then North America, I think, you know, more and more uh, benefit it would be to the all different parties. Rose, you want to add anything in terms of how you see the lens on your side? Yeah, I just think, you know, the first thing, why it's easy for Bolero to talk the electronic bills of lading is the name Bolero actually stands for Bill of Lading Electronic Registry Organisation. So when the company was founded, it was basically first task to, to remove uh, paper bills of lading. So, tech, you know, I've said this to a lot of guys I talk to about technology. It's not the technology, it's the acceptance of the technology. So having something that works technologically versus gaining acceptance from the broader community, the exporters, the importers, the carriers, the ports, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that came with a lot of blood, sweat and tears and, and it's, you know, a work in progress. But everything Bolero has put together has, has been well used for over 16 years commercially um, in terms of electronic bills of lading, you know, from full digital EBLs end to end from, you know, seller to buyer with carriers involved. Um, so none of this is theoretical. It's all practice. Yep. Uh, the P&I club approval has been in place for a long time. Yep. I think one thing to note about the number of carriers at all, I think both of you were watching a different ball today. We took our eyes off something because it should be over 200 carriers, uh, not cricket balls. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, that's, let, it, let me do the day if I pitch at, at Gabba. So. Yeah, all right. So so we, should, we, we just need to update that. Here. And their bulk carriers are a very massive number, a huge number of vessels. So they're, they're able to provision EBLs at the client's request, which nicely plug into our combined solution. And a lot of the, um, uh, I think, eight out of 10 of the world's top container liners are using Bolero. And there's, well, there's two, three of those with integration into their e-business solutions uh, at present. So it's sort of under the covers, you don't know that Bolero is involved because it's like, you know, your PC, it's like Intel chip. So Bolero is doing the EBL, the carrier fronts it, it's white labeled and um, and they're pumping out, especially the last year with COVID uh, uh, necessitating a lot of things done electronically, huge increase of electronic bills of lading through these carriers, uh, e-business solutions. Yep. No, in fact, I could relate one story. I was talking to one carrier, you know, who uses Bolero and, and you know, they, they, they have been saying that, look, you know, we've been using it for all along, but, you know, you know, my board wants me to talk about something else. So let me talk about something else. But, you know, if you want to do real stuff on to, you know, do the, you know, the actual shipments electronically, you know, we, we would be happy to do plenty of that. Right. So I think uh, it, you got a large, uh, you know, array of carriers to help. And I think the port pairs, uh, we probably, you know, it enables most of the trade routes where we could do, uh, we could do this. Uh, I think there, there are always a question that come up arose and, and that's probably one that also came up from our team when we were preparing for this was also what happens to the last mile connectivity, if you will. Right. So, you know, how do we handle that? Is that something that kind of, you know, we have a solution on or, you know, we, literally can go down to the last mile with the Bolero solution within, within the within a port in a country or uh, you have any general comment on that or you know we should only be looking at a certain pair port pairs to begin with or, or any any guidance on that would be helpful maybe oh, well, and Bolero, that did well, come up. Well, yeah Bolero was built day one to go end to end so it can go right through from uh, from an import to a destination port uh, it just depends whether the port wants to get things electronically. Um, some of the ports around the world have their own electronic portals and people just have to attach their documents to the portal. But, you know, we've had customers that wanted full digital so they can upload data to their back office and that's possible with a port system. So it's right. just the desire to be fully digital versus accepting the current processes is, is, is what drives it. So, for example, you're mentioning about Taiwan, right? So, in, in like in Taiwan, it would, would it be like any ports that you would be fine with, or it, it would be only one or two ports that would work initially? You think? Oh, you yeah. Know, well, just, just <laughs> on that an example. Um, usually, in a country, it's great if you've got one port. So, we've done port uh, particular ports in in Taiwan, and what happens then is uh, the other thing is if you get a big um, shipper, big exporter. 
Uh, they tend to have a lot of sway in a market, so that can that can move a market. The other thing we found in China was if one port was accepting the EBL, where, where the cargo had an EBL involved, and another port didn't, um, the buyer can actually switch for which port they want to just have the goods discharged, and that uh, port that didn't want to participate would lose from business. And it's amazing how quickly that they would start to accept um the electronic well, process. It, it becomes so, more of a value-added service uh, and it's kind of differentiated in, in some sense of the world. Yeah, well, I've, you know, some country companies I've dealt with, they said, look, we're a 150-year-old company. We've got 200-year-old business practices, so they don't want to change. So it, there's, there's got to be some catalyst to change and, and that's, you know, it can be done in a nice way and it, it's moved it. But um, yeah, you know, in a lot of countries, things just start with one and then it grows. But what I've found is a lot of these things can be country orientated. So you've always got to get the first in a country and then you can you can spread it out. But until you've got one in a country, some country doesn't care what another country does. So, yeah. you know, that's all the education process and building process. No, absolutely, you're right. And 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 I think, uh, you know, what's the need from, um, from a deal to legis point of view, I think, you know, we're absolutely thrilled to be partnering with Waller, you know, who has already done a messy amount of work on, on the uh, digitizing the bill of lading. And, you know, it's all about ecosystem, right? So I think we need to connect the dots, uh, as I said, from a people point of view, from a process point of view, uh, from an adoption point of view. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done on the interoperability point of view as well. So it's building an ecosystem. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, the corporates, the customers that we have, we want to give them a flexibility. They want to actually continue to, you know, work with, uh, you know, some of our customers we find they already run Bolero, so they want to actually connect deal to ledgers to Bolero. Uh, they want to actually do more and more trade routes, more and more port fares. So you know, continue to build an ecosystem. We see a great value in that. Continue to support the customers because at the end of the day, I think more and more everybody benefits in this call if we actually can do an end-to-end -end digital transaction, right? And that that cannot happen with one party because it has to happen with the network and you know if we can support that more and more repeat trades happening with our customers which could get increasingly digital and i know there would be naysayer in this group will say hey what happens to a surveyor what happens to a forwarder what happens to that guy that guy but you know i think as we can have minimum viable parties uh to really keep doing more and more of repeat and and like his like Perot said right you know there would be always a set of customers who will be tucking behind their old way of doing things, maybe they would be the legates, but I think we have now crossed the chasm. So we are into, I think, early majority in terms of the adoption cycle. So continue to support customers is one of the key reasons we, we partner. And then obviously to win the business, right? So, uh, you know, we, we do see opportunities with, with, with our uh, combined forces. We see that, you know, there's an opportunity to win and uh, additional set of business which will benefit both DLT Ledger as well as uh, as Bolero. So what's the need for Bolero or to you, Ross? Um, well, obviously, uh, to work with a company like DLT Ledger, who's um, applying uh, latest technology um, to be able to work with that technology and leverage off it, um, it is a great opportunity for Bolero to bring to the table and enhance its reputation, but not just that, to actually fill in the gaps, you know, like uh, it's very hard to do everything on your own in international trade. It's, it's really complicated. So that's, that's, that's a key thing, you know, to, to build the, I guess, the perception that Bolero has not um, been there, done that and, and gone out the back door sort of thing. Um, I, I think, you know, I've, you know, knowing, you guys at all. There's there's a, a, a great investment in the company and, and a push with marketing and sales and the market reach to fill in some of the gaps where Bolero doesn't have as many feet on the ground. Um, yep. But given we, everything we do is electronic, you know, always with Bolero, we've never had to have <laughs> so many offices and that. So, you know, we've got core offices in the UK, in uh, in Japan, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, and that's that's how we sort of support the business um, currently globally. And nah, like, like I mentioned before, you know, to, to blend in with the latest technology, um, you know, Bolero does not use uh, any blockchain uh, service directly. Um, not that it's say it won't in the future, but, you know, we're not using AI and machine learning. 
So why not go with people that are experts and, and, and making great pace forward, but fill in the gap, like Atul said, you know, bring to the table, not just the technology of the EBL, but the acceptance by corporates, uh, in-country acceptance, proven utilisation, and not the least is, um, you know, apart from the banks and the corporates, but the carriers, you know, the carriers are um, coming across and, and starting to even implement it in their own e-business solutions. Um, so it's, it's yeah. a great opportunity to work together. No, absolutely. And just the final thing uh, on in terms of the partnership, we have been working very closely with Sunil, Sunil here in Singapore, as well as Rose uh, to cover the North Asia and Australasia part. So, uh, you know, we, we are really working hand to hand to really benefit our customers towards the digitization. And I think we believe that uh, 2021 uh, would be really a year where I think it takes off, uh, certainly with Singapore going all guns blazing with electronic documentation, getting it passed in, in the parliament and the last couple of weeks has been fantastic here locally. I think we, we are in for, for an exciting time. And with that, what I'll do is I'll just, uh, you know, keep this session open for the questions because we wanted to make sure at the start of the session, we want to talk more about taking the questions and, you know, if there is any comments or questions that people may have, we can discuss that. So, so certainly that's something that uh, uh, I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, uh, can, we, can we have any questions uh, if, any one of you have any questions for either Rose or myself? Or are there any chat questions, uh, Andrea? Yeah, thanks for the presentation, uh, Sul and Ross. It was really, really interesting from my side. I you know, I'm just asking myself, you know, whether somebody would like to step in and ask something in this respect. I think there's a question yeah, I think from there is a, there is a question. There is a question from Rahul. May I request Rose to dwell on the regulatory acceptance of EBL? Um, that's the first question. And then secondly, also the ports recognizing EBL without converting into paper. Yeah, so there's, there's only, there's a few countries in the world who will not accept an EBL. So when we talk about countries, um, we see more issues on the import side than the export side. Um, although I know in Bangladesh, there was issues with export side um, just because bank regulations sort of stood in the way. But predominantly, as we've, as we've gone from country to country, um, on the export side, it's usually been a free flow. No, no, nobody really gets in the way at a port. Um, on the import side, the challenges that we've met was one: if there'd never been anything done in a um, in a country, it's very easy for the naysayers to say, "Oh, you can't use an EBL because of X, Y, Z." And you know, I could write a book on the number of reasons not to change. But was there any solid reason for not doing it? No. So we found countries where. Um, they, they, they have different rules in different ports. So there might be a country uh, customs rule that affects the, the, the port operations, but each port doesn't necessarily follow the same rule book. They have a local imp interpretation. And some ports would say, well, we, all we need is the, is the BL number. So whether it is an EBL or is a paper BL, it didn't matter. They, to get discharge, all you need to do is provide the BL number. Some ports said, we, all we need is a copy of the, B, of the BL. Well, you can give a copy of an EBL, um, that's fine. Um, there are a few instances where people said, we must have a, a paper BL. So we would ask them why? And they would say, oh, we've had so many frauds with BLs, we want the original BL. So then we say, well, you want the original paper BL that you've already had frauds with. Wouldn't it be better if you had an EBL to obviate the risk of fraud? And they go, Oh yeah, that's a great idea. So then they're happy with that. But the underlying question has also got one issue. An EBL can terminate at the importer. And once they surrender the EBL, the EBL does not exist. They surrender it back to the carrier. The carrier gives the importer a delivery order. They can pick up their goods. So 
there's this thing that an EBL exists right through to the port. Well, that if the port doesn't want to receive it electronically, the EBL is already gone. It, it's 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 terminated. So there is no EBL to actually connect to a port and to suffer any regulatory issue. But if you roll that up into one comment, the major issue is, has there been one done in a country at a port? Because if there hasn't, then you've got a big education challenge to get over. And, and that's, you know, that's been a lot of the work we've done over the years, just to break down those barriers. How that can often happen is you get a major exporter shipping to a major importer and, you know, then all, all the issues change. And nowadays we're seeing a lot of countries actually start to regulate that, you know, you will accept electronic documents, you will accept digitization, you will accept electronic signature. So a lot of my comments are based on probably 19 years of history with Bolero. But the last year has been a massive change in that. But I'm not saying that every port in the world is not going to come up with a, you know, with a with a, a pushback. Um, but it requires a lot of education to get over those barriers. Yeah. No. And and that's fantastic, uh, Rose. Uh, thank you for that. And and just also to uh, you know, common question that all every time you know we get from customers as well. Well, okay. Can you give me by country whether it's regulatory? you know, whether you will have electronic BL uh, and then can I blanket to say that this country is going to accept electronic BL. So I think Ro what Rose is saying, it is answered, it really uh, depends on the combo of a cor corporate and the port in that country, right? So it's not necessarily a blanket yes or a blanket no. Uh, Rose, Rose, is that correct? So for example, if it is Australia, can I say it is a blanket yes? for, you know, if anybody wants to do electronic BL out of Australia, yes, or it is actually based on a customer and a port, and then, you know, it's customer willingness to do electronic BL, and therefore it will happen, right? So maybe that could be useful to just dwell on to that yeah. as well. Well, we haven't seen any issues in countries like Australia, China, where there's been a lot of trade flows using EBL, Korea, Japan, um, you know, South India. America to the US, India. Yeah, as well. well, no, India's India's great on the export side. Uh, it's been a bit slower on the import side, um, but making great strides at the moment. So right. you know that the, the situation's changing there. So I think um, th there was one other thing I was going to mention. The one of our partners, a carrier, one of the top top three. Uh, container liners, they, they've actually got a great sales kit that they talk about their EBL, e-business solution. It doesn't Thanks. mention Bolero, but they've actually mapped globally and they've got a nice map that shows you where EBLs are accepted globally. Now, I, oh, I can't yeah. hand that out, but I could refer, if anybody wants to know, I could refer it to that company because that, that bit of collateral is really, really spectacular. It answers this question really well. No, that's, that's great. No, that would be great uh, uh, to share as well. And I think there's a question from Roland to say that there, it appears there are many ecosystems in trade, finance, but also in the wider economy. Will DLT ledgers and Bolo are able to interoperate with multiple ledgers? If so, how? If not, why not? Thanks. So I'll take that, Rose. I think it is, it, as, as I said at the start of my presentation, right? Absolutely, interoperability is key. And in fact, it is quite fascinating to note that uh, the interoperability in the technical level has already been achieved across multiple ledgers. So I don't think, you know, it's a fault of the technical team in terms of not able to interoperate. It is also always about the flows and also process and, and the adoption, right? So Rose mentioned that even though if I have perfect ledgers and perfect, you know, uh, setup for my um, destination port and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, load port, uh, but if the customer doesn't want to change his process, it's not going to happen, right? So I think... Uh, interoperability is, is, as I said, you know, the lens on the technical side of the lens is fairly straightforward. I think the lens where we all need to do a lot of work is on the business side of the house, making the trade flows. Just now what Rose mentioned, right? If you look at the trade flows and say from Singapore to Australia, let's say, or to Middle East, from Dubai into, into coming into Southeast Asia, or, you know, from Southeast Asia going into China, or let's say Africa coming into parts of Asia. So when you look at the flows, look at the port pairs and see how much of the trade flow can be digitized, I think that number is very, very, very small, right? So I think, uh, and that's where I think 
you know, Emmanuel is on the call. My request, Emmanuel, if you are there, I think one of the number that I would like to hear this year from World Economic Forum is to see, you know, how much of the $18 trillion trade is actually conducted digitally? Because there has been no real sense of that and that would really help us to say, okay, now we were at X, now we are going to go to Y. So I think this debate on interoperability will always continue unless there is a parameter, but you know, that's something, it's a great question, but you know, we don't believe that reality there is a problem there because we are not able to measure it and as you know, uh, you know, whatever is not getting measured will not get done, right? So, you know, long answer to your question, Ronald, but uh, open for your comment, Emmanuel or, or Rose, if you have any on that. I just add two things. There's, there's, I was actually going to be on another conference call, which overlapped, so I didn't sit on it tonight, but it's a DCSI, Digital Container Shipping Initiative, and the right. subject was EBL standards. So right. there's two issues, really. That to add to this, apart from the technology, which is great, there are standards and there's legal issues. So there's laws in country and there's global initiatives, you know, with the ICC uh, doing things around uh, international trade flows. So that's why it's complicated because, you know, it tends to fragment when you go by different countries and how they do things. Um, and each country's got its own strategy with digitization. So there needs to be some normalization, um, you know, standards. And this goes back to what Swift did with banking, fantastic. But there's the legality as well. You know, you can you get standards, you can talk easy between systems and do the integration easier. Um, but then there's a the legal aspect to make sure it's legal to accept electronic documents. And, you know, that affects a lot of issues. But those two things are key. Yeah. All right. I think we are, we are fighting away with the chats here. I think, are you able to comment? By the way, Emmanuel, you had any comments? If you feel free to jump in. Uh, th thanks, Atsu. No, actually, uh, nothing to add to what Ross was saying. I think uh, he, he summarized it very well. Uh, you have the tech aspect, but you also have the legal aspect and the, this, uh, the standardization dimension. And uh, we're all trying to work together to try and make it happen, but it's, uh, it's challenging. What's coming up in 2021 so that I can keep and look out for you for any new reports coming up from your side? There would be a few, and uh, there, there may be, uh, I'm, I'm trying to schedule the next uh, Global Trend Blockchain event uh, on the 18th of March. So that's the date I've put aside for the moment. So you can already mark your agenda. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. And uh, I'll take the next question as well. Are you able to comment on the means and limitation of inputting data into EVL? For example, are there needs for physical digital infrastructure throughout the supply chain? Is this something? can or should be accommodated. Uh, Rose, you want to give it a try in terms of the limitation of inputting data? I haven't heard that before on EBL. No, no limits. It comes down to the, usually the desire of whoever's creating a document. So an EBL is actually, well, it can be drafted between the shipper to the carrier, but at the end of the day, the absolute EBL is created by the carrier. And you know, we, we had a service running on Bolero in 2004, which was totally digital. So the carrier would create a digital EBL, would go through from buyer to, uh, from seller to buyer and the, seller, the buyer would upload the, the data from the EBL as well as your other uh, commercial and um, inspection documents um, into their ERP system. So it's possible the Bolero EBL that will plug in with DLT ledgers is actually XML based. So we're yeah. ready for digital. It's just, if you don't get somebody creating data at source digitally, um, it's hard to change it along the way on the supply chain. And I think that, that comes back to the standards thing because everybody wants the standard. So you know, that's why that container shipping initiative, digital standard for EBLs is a, is a great initiative. Yeah, no, absolutely. So just to add on to that, yes, absolutely. There is no real limitation on that part. Uh, and I, I, there isn't any physical digital infrastructures like, you know, uh, I think what he, the, you know, what is being alluded here is probably, uh, you know, Rose, things like, you know, do I need a, a you know, a, a specific printer at the port to print if I want converting an electronic BL into a paper BL, do I need like a printer with a, with a you know, kind of a whole mark or some kind of a, you know, things that, you know, it's only will print it once and then it will 
it as it from elsewhere. Probably that's where the question is alluding to. So do you really need any specific printers, if you will, if you're converting to paper? Not really, right? No, but uh, the carriers offer a remote print service. So what they don't need a specific printer, but it's it's a service that they would offer and they have their own paper with their letterhead and all that sort of stuff at, at the recipient's um, office. And that's how they do a uh, remote BL type service. Right, got it. All right, and then there is one more question from Luca saying that from legal perspectives, are there any plans to review the Bolero rule book in light of amendment to Singapore Electronic Transaction Act? This will allow uh, to issue EBL with full legal validity. You have any comment on that, Rose? Yes, such you already anyway do that, right? So, well, the way the way Bolero is set up, um, Bolero International is, is like the platform operating company, but then there's a Bolero Association, which are all the users, and all the users um, impact things like the rule book and changes to that. So those things can be worked through. And what Bolero always wants to do is adapt to in-country um, progress that's being made. So, and, you know, with Sing you know, Singapore, Australia has initiatives with digitization. So things like that that come up, of course, Bolero looks to leverage any in any way shape or form we can make things adapt and make things flow faster so the answer would be yes now is it happening at the moment i don't know um i like to take that question offline yeah absolutely and just to just to add on to that we are we are into the thick of action with the singapore ets so uh i think that uh, watch out for this space and you know we will provide an update uh, as soon as it is available but yeah it's a great question so thank you for that. I think, Andrea, back to you. If you have any questions yourself, uh, I think we've been having some good questions on the chat. No, I'm fine for me. I mean, we have another question actually from Fami Montgomery to if you're, I know we are running out of time, uh, you know, I uh, just would like yeah. to give full answers to the attendance. Um, <laughs> Fami is asking, what do you, about Indonesia acceptance readiness of e bill of lading and blockchain trade TX. Yeah, I, I think I will just give I, from my point of view, it is really absolutely depends on there are obviously Indonesia has lots of ports, but I think there are certain ports uh, which are which are good for uh, electronic transaction. But then again, you know, I'll defer it to Rose to see, you know if there is anything peculiar that you see in Indonesia, which, you know, prevents, but I think I do uh, re recollect from Sunil that, you know, it's not an issue at all as far as, you know, Bolero is concerned to support Indonesia port waves. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've got some customers that want to uh, export into Indonesia. And I, I guess where I just put the, that into is that, so far, I haven't seen any of my customers been able to do that. And I hear that there's some initiatives through the ICC and the banks uh, to work with the, the regulators in, in Indonesia to make, make things more approachable uh, for uh, digital solutions uh, and acceptance uh, legally in Indonesia. So I, I do believe there's, there's some momentum in that space at the moment that will open yeah. up things. So what's the space, uh, Femi? <laughs> But uh, 2021 definitely, I think, would be the year in Southeast Asia because, you know, I think uh, you know Singapore government is leading the the panel of G2G countries, which includes all Southeast Asian countries. They are driving hard about uh, digital standards, and you know, as uh, Rose mentioned, digital standard initiative is also headquartered out of Singapore, and they are taking all the Southeast Asian countries together uh, as far as the standards are getting built. So I think. Uh, sooner than later, I would say. Amy. Any other questions from the attendants? No, I think uh, what we are trying to do is really kind of uh, focus on doing uh, more and more uh, transactions and, and opening up the trade flows rights from different parts of the ports. I think 
it would be handy, I think, Andrea, if we, we take that up as trade finance sick project to see, you know, based on the world today on, you know, electronic end-to-end um, uh, -end digitization, um, you know, which are the port, uh, which are the port pairs across countries are open for, for uh, you know, acceptance of digital uh, BL solution. I think that would be a good little project to do because I think, you know, we, you know, for example, Indonesia is a great question because, you know, they have a number of ports. Now, obviously, you, you know, which port that would be my most likely uh, for me to work together with, I think it'd be a bit of a research that we could take the offline in Rio and see if our team can kind of put some like I think you are breaking up. Oh, sorry. Okay. My feeling is that, you know, I don't know what's going on maybe here. The connection is not that good. Uh, I was telling uh, digitization port is going very fast in the APEC region. Mm -hmm. uh, we should try to be as fast as possible to keep the pace even in other parts of the world, namely Europe. We, we're stepping up. I mean, at least we're trying to do so, but, you know, uh, we're still struggling, you know, to come to keep the pace of, uh, of Asia. Something will happen for sure to happen shortly afterwards, both in Middle East and in Africa, in Northern Africa, namely, because we are so well connected. I expect something else to happen also in Turkey, which is a key country. But, you know. Just keep an eye on what's going on, as you can see from my posts on LinkedIn. Try and follow up. Yeah. It is about no, it's awesome. creating a group. Yeah, so, you're breaking up, uh, but I think absolutely uh, you're breaking up, uh, and we have that. I'm having a bad connection these days. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I'm sorry. That's all right. But I think uh, we can take that uh, as the next topic internally for us to discuss. But I, th I think with that, uh, we are coming to the close of the, the session. Uh, and yeah, if there's any final question, if not, I would like to thank um, yes. you and to set this up for us. You're welcome, Atul. My pleasure and honor. Uh, so hopefully, we go for some more interesting uh, very soon. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Rose, uh, for uh, staying up and being really a good uh, co-presenter along with me. I think I really enjoyed it. And let's let's kick some tires and get some good business in, and we can report the success back to NVA again. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, nice. for tuning in. Thank you. Take care, Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. See you soon.